Thanks very much for staying with us. Time now for Eye on Africa with me, Georgia Calvin-Smith. Tonight, several people are killed in a suicide car bombing in Mogadishu just days after Somalia's divided leadership agrees on a timetable for long-delayed elections. Al-Shabaab jihadists claim responsibility. Also, supporters of a Zimbabwean freelance journalist charged with getting fake accreditation to help colleagues from the New York Times enter the country say that he's being set up. Jeffrey Moyo pleads not guilty as this trial begins. And Mali's 1-0 AFCON win over Tunisia is overshadowed by a final whistle controversy. The match has a bizarre end as the referee calls time minutes early and the Tunisians refuse to return to the pitch. But first, Somali extremist group Al-Shabaab has said it is responsible for a suicide bombing in Mogadishu in which several people were killed. The jihadists claim that they were targeting foreign officers. Wednesday's attack came just days after the country's leaders had finally managed to thrash out a new timetable for long-delayed elections. Laurent Berstecker with more. Rising over the Mogadishu skyline, the smoke could be seen from the other side of town. At the site of the attack, only charred vehicle carcasses remained, following a blast so powerful it even damaged adjacent buildings. Passerbys who helped carry the wounded described scenes of chaos and carnage. The Al Shabaab jihadist group claimed responsibility for the attack, which it said was targeting foreign officers. Witnesses said a security convoy carrying foreigners was passing through the area when the explosion took place, but the UN later denied rumors any of its personnel or contractors were among the victims. Somalian authorities condemned the attack on Twitter and called on the population to remain united. Such acts of terrorism will not derail the peace and the ongoing development in the country. We must unite in the fight against terrorism. The latest attack took place just days after Somali leaders agreed on holding long-delayed parliamentary elections at the end of February. The polls could potentially see the end of a year-long political crisis, which has drained resources and efforts away from the ongoing fight against the Al-Shabaab insurgency. In Zimbabwe, the trials begun of a freelance journalist who was arrested last year and charged with breaching immigration laws. Jeffrey Moyo is accused of obtaining fake press accreditation documents from the, the Zimbabwe Media Commission for two colleagues from the New York Times. The newspapers said the charges against him are baseless. Our Ryan Truscott tells us more. Lawyers say Jeffrey Moyo pleaded not guilty at the start of his trial at the magistrate's court in the second city of Bulawayo. They say the evidence against him is extremely weak as the authorities have failed to provide evidence. Moyo, a 37-year-old freelance journalist, is accused of obtaining fake media accreditation documents so that two of his colleagues from the New York Times could enter Zimbabwe in May last year. The two, Christina Goldbaum and Joao Silva, were deported after just four days in the country, and Moyo was arrested and detained for three weeks before he got bail. The formal charge he now faces is under Zimbabwe's immigration laws. He could be liable for a fine or a 10-year jail term on conviction. The state has called three witnesses, and the trial is expected to last several days. Media rights groups say that Moyo's arrest and prosecution raises questions about the state of press freedom in the country. On the World Press Freedom Index last year, Zimbabwe was ranked 130 out of 180 countries, according to Reporters Without Borders. The press watchdog said then that while there had been positives like improved access to information, journalists in Zimbabwe are still frequently arrested or harassed. At least three people, including two children, were killed in the collapse of a church in Nigeria. About 18 people were rescued after the building went down in Asaba in Delta State on Tuesday evening. It fell to pieces as an evening service was being held there. Reportedly, it was the first time the church had been used. The country's building standards have come under particular scrutiny since 45 people were killed after a block of luxury apartments collapsed in Lagos in November. And Nigeria is lifting the ban on Twitter. President Mohamedou Buhari approved the end of the suspension on Wednesday, over six months after it was first imposed because of a controversial tweet from Buhari that was removed from the platform. Authorities had set several conditions for the return of the microblogging site in the country. 
Those have reportedly been met, including an agreement for Twitter to open a local office in Nigeria. Now, separatist rebels have kept up attacks in Cameroon, despite the extra security measures being brought in as the country hosts the Africa Cup of Nations. Anglophone fighters exchanged fire with soldiers in the city of Buya on Wednesday. It's the home of several of the football teams in the country to compete in the tournament. Our correspondent reports. At least two people are reported dead after a fierce gun battle broke out between separatists and government forces in Boya, capital of Cameroon's restive southwest region. Witnesses say that the shooting took place on Wednesday morning when the Malian national team was training ahead of its opening match against Tunisia in the ongoing Africa Cup of Nations. Armed militiamen who've been fighting defense forces in the crisis prone northwest and southwest regions of the country have repeatedly called for um, a shutdown during the tournament, threatening to disrupt games in the area. On Tuesday, opposition senator barista Henry Kemende was also shot dead in Bomenda in the northwest region. Well, no group has so far claimed responsibility for the attack, although many sources have attributed it to separatist fighters. Local authorities say that investigations have now been opened to identify the killers of the vocal lawmaker. In the meantime, Cameroonian authorities had deployed additional troops to the southwest region of the country, where uh, Mali, Tunisia, Mauritania and the Gambia will be playing Group F matches at the ongoing 2021 Africa Cup of Nations. Claudia Sono there for us. Now, Tunisian fans following the Africa Cup of Nations are still outraged over the confusing end to their team's match against Mali on Wednesday. The referee ended the game after 89 minutes and 47 seconds when it was scheduled to last 93, 93 minutes, including extra time. A decision that's made the Carthage Eagles 1-0 loss to Mali hard to swallow. We should play the match again. The refereeing was just unfair. I'm so disappointed. It's just not right. A referee stops the game too early, then comes back, calls on the players to carry on, and stops the match again. It's a joke. I wonder if Tunisia can appeal. I'm so disappointed. Well, James Vazina was in Limbe as the drama unfolded. Chaos and a confusion here in Limbe, where the opening game in a Group F came to an abrupt end as Tunisia uh, was facing off against Mali. Uh, now, we were all shocked. Everybody in the stadium uh, was surprised as the referee uh, blew his whistle before uh, any added time was announced. Now, the game restarted only for the referee to blow his whistle early once again. Now, as you can imagine, uh, all the Tunisian side was absolutely furious as they ran onto the pitch. Uh, to go and speak to the referee. He had to be escorted uh, off by security. Uh, now, then the press conference started and it was announced that the game was going to restart just for a couple of minutes. Uh, that didn't happen. Uh, but, of course, fury uh, from fans around here. This is the gesture that we're seeing from a lot of them. Uh, has the referee absolutely lost his mind? Uh, now, the referee uh, was banned uh, a couple of years ago on suspicions of corruption, but, of course, that doesn't do anything for them today uh, as Tunisia leave from this opener uh, with zero points. Mali, however, it has to be said, uh, fully deserved that win as they, uh, they leave uh, with a 1-0 win in this opening game. Uh, they managed to uh, put in that penalty uh, from the beginning of the second half. A brilliant, uh, brilliantly slotted in there and they also denied uh, a chance for Tunisia to equalise in a penalty later on. So an absolutely brilliant performance from them uh, as Tunisia were clearly shaken up throughout the game, didn't really manage to build uh, anything there. Uh, but hats off uh, to Mali. Now this means uh, of course, that they do continue uh, their winning streak and this trend uh, of having never lost a single opening game uh, at the beginning of their Africa Cup of Nations campaign. Well, somewhat overshadowed on Wednesday, Gambia's debut match at AFCON ended in victory. The 1-0 win over Mauritania got the Minnows off to an encouraging start at their first time at the flagship tournament. They failed 16 times to qualify and are hoping to make their mark in 2022. And Wednesday's final game pit one of the giants of the continent Ivory Coast against Equatorial Guinea. Now, the Ivorian Elephants have a sterling pedigree, but Equatorial Guinea has pulled some impressive performances out in the past. Nevertheless, it wasn't meant to be, and they lost 1-0 to Ivory Coast. 
Now, Thursday will see Ethiopia head once more into the fray. It lost 1-0 to Cape Verde on Sunday, but the squad has high hopes for its next showdown. As the country struggle, continues to struggle with an ongoing conflict, the team says that they hope to stand for unity. As you know, we are the underdog teams in this tournament, and always the pressure is, is not on us. The pressure is on Cameroon. Playing with bigger teams means like you have an advantage, psychological advantage. We do have a psychological advantage. So that if we can do a little bit, it can be maximized a lot. As a result of this, uh, the team is very much uh, ready to play against Cameroon. Actually, uh, we know that what is happening in our country. So the, the players are, they are very much eager to win a game, to give some positive emotions back home, to give some energy for the peoples around Ethiopia so that uh, I think it, it gives us a little bit advantage so that the energy, we do have extra motivation than other countries in order to give something better at this tournament because we need it very badly. We need it very badly. We need to show our capacity for the, for the world, not only for Africa. So this will be a huge to tournament. This will be a very good platform to see, uh, to give the other nations who we are, how we play, the playing style, our discipline, everything. We have prepared for every aspect of the game. Well, that's it for Iron Africa for now. Thanks for joining us and do so again if you can. Take care.